Hi everyone, this is Freddy with Superbike Unlimited and we're gonna bring you another update on the 2021 ZX10 RR Superbike project. As you can see, it's been torn down quite a bit already. We really have very little time to get this machine ready and so we're getting right to it. So far, Texas got our Evol Technology custom rear set kit and we'll go a bit into that a little bit later, but these are kind of like a special sort of one-off version of the rear sets specific to our needs, something that we had developed on the old bike. and. Uh, so right now what we're getting ready to do is fit our Suter Superbike swing arm. Right now we, uh, you'll, you'll notice this is basically a complete assembly that we've used on our previous generation ZX10 RR and it should just bolt right up to this new frame because a lot of the measurements are basically the same. And uh, this swing arm is basically a full world Superbike spec swing arm. Of course we have a special Coromoto Apex 6 wheel in there. Uh, that's designed to specifically to fit the width of this swing arm, which is much wider than normal. And uh, so that's what we're going to be doing right now is beginning to swap over some of the goodies that will be a direct fit to this bike. <clears throat> okay, so we've gotten this fitted and I'm just going to go into a bit of detail about uh, this swing arm and uh, sort of the concept behind running this. Basically, this is going to be a totally different design from the standard swing arm in that it's, for one, considerably longer. The range of adjustment starts quite a bit further back from the original, which is one reason why right now the axle blocks is kind of far forward. This is this even on a stock arm would be considered rather long. Um, and this is a uh, one generation of this. There are actually more than one version of this swing arm. There is a version of it that's essentially shorter. So, you know, with this wheelbase setting, maybe the uh, the axle adjuster would be in the middle of the slot. So that's something to keep in mind is there's not just one version of that swing arm. There's more than one revision. Um, but the reason we use a swing arm like this is because it really enhances feel and grip on the motorcycle and stability. Um, it makes the rear end of the bike just a lot more consistent and predictable. And there's a lot more load on the tire and just overall feel. So it just gives the rider a lot more control and confidence. Um, it's for us one of the one of the things that when I rode this bike, I could tell an immediate difference putting that swing arm on it just totally changed it. One thing that's cool about these, a lot of superbike swing arms require you to run crazy shocks or shocks that are completely different from uh, from standard. We do run a very special shock absorber on this motorcycle, but you can run a stock, you know, a TTX or a, you know, whatever, K-Tech DDS or whatever you want. Basically a stock style shock absorber will fit in there. And they do provide you with a set of linkage plates. These are, I think actually this version is pretty similar to the stock. Um, uh, rising rate and progression. We actually have four different linkages that we alternate right now. We've just got this one on here for mocking up purposes, but um, there's several linkages that we use that we may change based on the tire or grip conditions or, you know, a number of variables, but you get one set of linkage plates with this swing arm and that's these guys right here. The others that we use are actually not made by Suter, but they, uh, a set of links for the stock swing arm will fit this swing arm. Okay, so we're coming along on this and we're actually uh, ignore what I said a minute ago about the linkage because we've already got one of the links that we're going to start off with on this bike. And the reason for that is that uh, Tex is actually getting ready to do a quick little uh, modification that we've needed to wrap up on our V4R project. So we got to get this thing at least as a roller. We might as well just put the stuff in there that we're going to start off with. So as you can see, this is a one of our superbike links that we run. This is essentially a world superbike or British superbike linkage that's very popular. Um, it's a little bit flatter than the stock stuff. And we've got this link rod that you can see is kind of like uh, sort of scalloped out there. And the reason for that is because when we put our superbike shock absorber on there, which is this guy here, um, it actually, there would be contact if that wasn't done. And also where you see where it says superbike unlimited there on the uh, pneumatic preload adjuster, we actually had to cut that down and uh, put that that kind of grippy tape stuff on there just to make it so that it would it would clear this uh, this dog bone. So when it, with the shocks, this is actually a, a full blown World Superbike shock, and that's kind of a a tricky thing to point out because obviously Kawasaki doesn't run this shock on their factory Superbike. They run a uh, a Showa kind of like a works product, but. The factory Kawasaki teams um, and BSB for a long time have used these and pretty much any top level super bike that's running only in suspension is going to run the shock absorber. And this particular model is called an RSP 40. Um, there are other variants and there's a newer version that's going to be kind of more cost effective and aimed at uh, sort of uh, meeting price caps. But here you can kind of see the uh, the basic concept. It looks a lot like a TTX, but it's... Um, 
basically a lot nicer. It weighs less. It's got a, uh, a 40 millimeter piston. It's got a, a TIN coated shaft. And when you take these apart, you just see that everything is just built to a higher level. Um, everything just works that much better on the shock absorber. So we're going to be putting that on here in a minute just so we can roll this guy. Okay, and we're moving on with the project, building our super bike. And one of the key things with a proper super bike compared to say a super stock bike, especially in Moto America's uh, stock 1000 rules are uh, that we have a lot more chassis adjustability and there's things that we can change. Some motorcycles are gonna be a bit more modular in this regard, but specifically what we're gonna be talking about today is steering head angle stuff and also offset. Um, and with a, a Kawasaki, you can actually buy from directly from Kawasaki. They sell a lot of kit race parts and you can get these steering head cups as they're called which essentially control the placement of the steering stem in the actual headstock here you can see we've gotten ours completely removed so it's just an open frame but you can get these different kinds of cups like these here that will allow you to change uh potentially the actual offset of the st of the stem so essentially where it's at relative to the center of the hole or also the angle so I believe the ones that Kawasaki sells are you can go plus or minus four millimeters, which is what this one is here. And we're just using these for a reference. These, these are actually not gonna be the ones that we install today, but um, you can do, uh, they sell ones that are plus or minus four millimeters. And that's literally just means that, you know, it's moving at four and aft, you know, a zero being dead center, you can move it four and aft, four millimeters at the top and the bottom. So it's moving in line. Or you can do rate cups that are going to essentially allow you to add or subtract half a degree or to full degree. And that's going to be where the top and the bottom move in uh, opposite directions equally and adjust the rake. And that rake value is basically going to be calculated at the center of the headstock here. So, you know, you're talking half a degree, four and a half or a full degree, four and a half. So the reason for this is a number of things. You can basically completely change the balance of the motorcycle or you can if you like the balance and you want to just get a particular a different load on on the front tire or change the trail dramatically or a number of things and then you also combine that with uh, triple clamp offset so it's a big it's a lot to comprehend and a lot to process but we've been of course racing this bike for a while so we have a pretty general idea of where we want to go on the new one we are going to try a couple of new things but today what we're going to be doing is starting off with exactly what we ran on the old chassis just as a starting point and then we have something we're going to test shortly thereafter okay and something else we'll show you guys is uh, there are some special tools that uh, make it a lot easier to install these accurately and you'll see basically we have these here these are essentially guides and what they do is they match these um these cutouts in this so that obviously like i said this can be used in either direction so that's why they're on all four sides but the uh the guides essentially ensure that when you install these that the thing's not going to be you know at, a, at an inaccurate angle and potentially have some kind of crazy steering geometry going inside of your cylinder head or excuse me your steering head and uh so that's what this is this is actually a kawasaki part and tool and they also uh provide tools that allow you to install and extract these and i definitely recommend it because We've tried doing it without them and you wind up just beating the hell out of these things. So it's, it just makes it a lot easier to get the correct tools. Um, so that's what we're going to be using today. And we're going to go ahead and start installing a set of cups. Okay. We're about to put the front end of the bike. And I just want to point out, I'm sorry that we're going to be doing some of this pretty quickly because obviously we kind of already had a pre-assembled front end. We're still going to go into some detail on some of these components, but if there's something that we kind of just, uh, rush over or you feel that we don't discuss enough in detail leave a comment and we're happy to you know kind of expand on that in the next video so anyway we're going to go ahead and put this front end on and while texas is getting that installed i'll just kind of give you guys a rundown of what we've got here and that's going to be right now on this bike we're we're using the olean's fgr 250 superbike fork which is a universal fork and uh has a pressurized spring pressurized uh cartridge and it's kind of like a production version of the World Superbike fork that we have on our V4 over there. Um, and uh, it's much less expensive. It's like half the price. Um, and uh, But it's a very good fork. We actually tested this one with Andrew Lee at uh, Barber Motorsports Park. And he was really pleased with it. And we gave him the option of using our uh, WSBK fork. And he basically said, no, I don't want to use that one. I like this one. So... It's uh, it's a really pretty badass fork that uh, um, doesn't cost a ton of money compared to some of the other stuff. Um, 
And with that, we're using, of course, a, a custom Cormoto Apex 6 front wheel. And uh, sorry about that. I could see the text needed a hand, and we uh, so I had to turn the camera off to assist him. So anyway, moving forward, uh, what we have is this FGR 250 fork. We have a set of uh, special Superbike triple clamps. These are basically the factory spec units that are used in the UK. And uh, right now, we're currently using Behringer Endurance calipers, which we really like. It's... Uh, basically a, uh, a super bike spec caliper that um, it's a billet two piece design. It has titanium pistons and uh, we've been really impressed with those. I think that for the money, that's uh, an excellent caliper. Those are paired with brake techs, Moto America specs, stainless 330 by six and a half uh, super bike discs. Of course we do have stout blade dry connects on these and we're using core moto lines on this build. Um, and, and again, we have this apex six custom front wheel that we're using to suit our uh, clamp and fork setup, which is a bit different from standard. This is a World Superbike front fender. And then on this side, we have our speed sensor, which is completely different from standard. This is kind of a the similar to the units, actually the same as used by many MotoGP bikes and by the factory Kawasaki's and World SBK. Uh, of course, we have an Autosport connector connecting that. And here you see our suspension pot, which we're gonna then connect to the bottom of the fork here. Um, we use a completely non-standard trigger that we actually designed with Guy Halbrooks for this system. Um, works well with our MoTeC electronics. Okay, we're in here doing some more upgrades on the bike today. It's another day at the shop and uh, we're gonna do a couple of things that are some of my personal favorite upgrades to the power plant uh, on this motorcycle. So what we've got here is just the OE clutch and something that uh, I've seen and I've personally experienced in my racing is that with that clutch, we see a lot of clutch wear, especially during launching and uh, not just on the plates, but also on the actual clutch assembly. They just seem to not last a long time. Um, it's almost as if they don't get enough oil. To be fair, that is on the old engine, but I don't really see that getting a lot better on this one. So something that we've been doing is using these suitor clutches. We've actually tested several clutches, including Yo-Yo Dyne and STM. And while the performance was not bad on the uh, on the two, STM being the better of those two options, um, the wear was still an issue. As soon as we switched to this guy, it was like our wear issues went away. And um, so for that reason, I'm a huge fan of these suitor clutches. They don't cost a ton of money and they just work really well. Um, that being said, you do need to change the springs on them a little more often than say, a conventional stock clutch you know we replace ours typically like a couple of times a year um, some professional racing teams may do it much more frequently it really depends on uh, what type of springs you're using and what type of wear and, and what you're seeing another thing we're going to do and this is a very uh, contentious and touchy subject around here we're going to change the gearbox now that's something i want to be very clear in case there's anyone foxing around in these videos um, we are only gonna run that gearbox when we're doing club racing. So in the past, now we have a nice brand new stock gearbox out of this brand new power plant. However, in the past, we've done a little bit of Moto America racing. One of those events, we did not have a stock gearbox, couldn't get one in time, ran this Billy gearbox that we're about to install. And there was another uh, person, entity, that was aware that we were running this gearbox and then decided to make a big stink about it. Didn't go over well for us. So. Just want to be clear, we will be switching that out. Should you see this motorcycle on the grid at Moto America, it's not going to have this gearbox. And as much as we might like that, we're going to take it out. So that gearbox is this Nova unit. Um, these are, as you can see, frankly, a work of art. This is one that we've used in the other engine. It got a really small amount of wear in it, but it's still well within spec. And this is a full billet unit that has a completely different, uh, each gear is a totally different ratio from standard. I'll have to go and look and compare them to the current ratio that's in this power unit versus the old one. But uh, generally we found that putting that in there just really suits the, the characteristic of this engine and just generally improves performance. And the nice thing, they just shift really well and they're super robust. That's the biggest benefit of it. We've seen some wear issues, some stuff breaking or wearing out a little bit quicker with the stock one. Those billet gearboxes are just bulletproof. They last forever. And they just feel really nice at the lever. Um, something that's kind of hard to explain, but it's uh, it's a nice upgrade. I'm a huge fan of those. So one thing that's really nice about these, um, you wouldn't do this whole swapping gearboxes thing very likely on something like a Yamaha R1 
because you have to split the cases to do a gearbox swap. On this, it's very easy because this has a cassette gearbox in it. So you essentially just pop out this clutch assembly, remove some other things, and it's really easy to change the gearbox. It doesn't take much time at all. So we're gonna be doing that today. And then, of course, when we're changing transmissions and there's different gear ratios involved, we have our Motec ECU that we're gonna be running. We're probably just going to use the M130 for the time being on this. We have an M130 and an M170. M130 is the Moto America spec ECU, and we've just gotten a really big firmware update today for the Moto America series, and it's a really good firmware update. It's actually probably better than what we were running on the M170 before. However, there is a new firmware for the M170 available now that's really nice. It's like... Uh, um, kind of a MotoGP-esque level of firmware. So that's something that we're gonna be looking into in the future. But uh, for now, we're gonna go ahead and pop this in, reprogram our M130 ECU with these new gear ratios, and uh, that part of it will be done. So now we'll show you how the installation goes. Something else we're gonna go ahead and knock out while we've got this open is we're gonna put our worldwide ceramic transmission bearing kit in there. This is a kit that's designed specifically for this ZX-10R engine. And this is a, just a nice upgrade to do while you're in here to improve performance and potentially gain some more power and speed. Okay, so we've got our basket out and we are ready to go ahead and pull this transmission assembly. And to get here, it's literally just removing a few bolts and circlips, clips essentially, right Tex? Pretty much, uh, you gotta pull the, obviously the clutch basket, you gotta pull the uh, oil pump drive gear. Uh, that is a reverse thread. So it's righty loosey, lefty tighty. Um, make sure you get all your your bolts out of your plate. Make sure you get your your shift shaft out of here. There is a circlip on the other side of that. And I also went ahead and broke loose these bolts for the bearing retainer because I know I'm going to have to break those loose and they'll be much more difficult to break loose once this is out of the engine. There you go. Okay, cool. So. guide for the shift forks to stay in the case. Ah, <laughs> and that just goes right down the middle of there. You can see that opening. That's where that guide's gonna be. So yeah, that's our complete stock trans assembly. And you can see that, uh, I wish actually, where's the, uh, is the other stock around here somewhere? Um, or is it already? I believe it's already installed. It's back in. Yeah. Okay. We had another one that basically our Moto America trans that we used at Indy that we had uh, basically treated and and micro finished, and it looked almost as nice as this. Not quite because it's still just a stock gearbox, but um, it's interesting to see sort of how dull this one looks in comparison. However, you can really polish these things up by uh, having a micro finish and improve shift performance a good bit, improves the smoothness and kind of deburs them a bit. So. Next, we're essentially gonna be installing this gearbox onto this plate here. We do retain the factory drum, and we keep this as well, right, Tex? Yes. Cool, and then it uh, just goes right back in, right? Mm -hmm. Cool, well, that's next. And while we've got this out, I'm just gonna go ahead and show you guys, these are the bearings that we're gonna be upgrading. It's gonna be these two here, and then two that are still inside the case. All the way on the back here, I was just asking Tex about that because there's a couple of bearings that are not upgraded with this kit because if any performance gain would be negligible or it's not available. This one here built into the drum, you can't replace that. And I was talking about this one because, uh, you know, it seems like it wouldn't be that difficult to replace, but essentially it's not constantly rotating. It's only the bearing that the drum rides on. So it's only used literally while the gear is being changed. So it's something that realistically a rider wouldn't even notice. This is uh, working over here on the gearbox. I'm gonna get in his way and uh, get a, uh, a shot of this throttle we're using. I just wanna show this because we are replacing the original throttle and we're just gonna use this, which is just an, an, another e-throttle. It's actually a Ducati unit that we have a few of. And uh, again, I mentioned we're gonna be testing a few throttles. That's just the one that we're gonna start off with. I like it. It doesn't cost a ton of money and it's got a nice feel. It's the throw is not too terribly long and it's got a metal housing and it's really compact as you can see. Um, we're doing that because obviously the stock one's huge and has all this other crap that we don't need on it. And uh, I don't actually really like the way it feels anyway. Um, there's probably an aftermarket housing or something we could throw in there to, to you know, eliminate all the extra parts that we're not going to use. 
But with a Motec Superbike system like what we're running on this, you can basically run any throttle you want as long as you terminate the harness or the throttle connector to match up with what you're using. So we can use literally any e-throttle from any application as long as everything's configured for it. So for now, we're just going to do that, and we're just going to keep using this Ducati plug on the, on the harness and any other throttles that we use will have this same plug, and that'll make it very interchangeable. And we'll set the harness up in a way so that we can, should this thing get destroyed in a crash or something, we can change the throttle out very quickly and not have to, you know, tear anything down like you would have on a previous generation motorcycle potentially. So that'll be good. All right, so we've got our Nova gearbox ready to go back in. You can see this thing is really a work of art. Super pretty machining and just all these pieces are polished to a mirror finish. So it's really nice to look at. And Texas is essentially just about to pop this back in. It's going to be a pretty straightforward process. Nice. There we go. Now we just bolt it all back up, huh? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, and it looks like Tex is uh, well on his way to wrapping this up. We're gonna get the clutch put back in and then we're just gonna go ahead and button this side of things up. And uh, yeah, for the sake of keeping this video from being super long and we wanna give you some more content, I think we're gonna wrap it up on this one and uh, we're gonna have a lot more coming to this motorcycle soon. One thing that's still kind of an unknown for us and we're, we have a potential solution, however, I don't know how fast it's gonna be, is body work. So it's, as frustrating as it may be, we might have to use the previous generation body work on it temporarily until we sort out what kind of body work we're gonna use and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's one thing that we're kind of like, not really sure how we're gonna handle, but we do have a whole bunch of uh, more upgrades that are gonna be going on this thing. And we're gonna be doing a lot of tuning probably uh, next week and um, I we're just gonna see exactly how much power this thing makes with a really nice pipe Which we're gonna have a video on a bit later and uh, and basically fully stock trim And then of course we're gonna drop the motor right back out again and uh, do a whole bunch of upgrades and try to make it nice and fast So thanks for watching be sure to uh, like this video comment below and subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you next time